Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and I am so excited that you're here to catch the weekly replay of my laid-back yet very inspiring conversations with other full-time professional artists. The purpose of this series is to show aspiring artists that it is completely possible to have a great career in the arts. And if you ever want to tune in and have your questions answered in real time by myself or featured guests, then just check out the schedule over at facebook.com slash groups slash Artist Academy every Tuesday to catch us on live. I'll see you there. This episode is sponsored by the Artist Academy Advanced Membership, a program for artists who want to up-level their art game by taking it from a hobby or a side hustle to a full-time six-figure art business. With weekly trainings that include step-by-step proven art business techniques, plus painting tutorials from yours truly (laughs) and other guest artists who are masters in their field, you will be well-equipped to learn and grow into the highly skilled and highly profitable artist you know you're meant to be. I've figured out what it takes to build my own six-figure art business, and now my heart is set on teaching aspiring artists like you to do the same. It's not hard, but it does require your time and dedication. So if you're up for the challenge, go to advancedmember.com. That's advancedmember.com to learn more. This week's episode is a recording from a live in our Artist Academy Advanced group, all about the legal side of the art business. Contracts, LLCs, copyrights, all the fun things that attorney Corey Kilburn joins us to ever so nicely explain. He explains the rights we have as artists with putting our artwork online, what a good contract should include, and ultimately how we can legally protect our art business so things run as as smoothly as possible. (laughs) And even though this isn't the sexiest topic like selling on Instagram, I still think it is very important to know some of this stuff even as a preventative measure. You don't know what you don't know, and Corey explains it very clearly so that anybody can follow along and take the steps to protect themselves in their art business. So let me know what you think about this fundamental subject for this week's episode with Corey Kilburn. So if you just kind of want to just start out by maybe introducing yourself and just saying a little bit about who you are, and then if you have any info that you think we might find valuable just right off before we get into the questions, we would love to hear anything that you have to say about legal stuff, because I get asked all these legal questions all the time, and I'm like, I think it's like this, (laughs) but let me ask a professional. (laughs) No, no, I, that's awesome. I really appreciate you having me on. Um, this is really exciting for me. Uh, my name's Corey Kilburn. I am uh, an attorney here in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, I own Roundtable Legal. Uh, it's a boutique law firm uh, that I started that uh, practices, uh, the, the focus of the practice is on arts and entertainment, intellectual property, and business law. So I handle uh, all kinds of things from trademarks, copyrights, contracts, royalty agreements, uh, licenses, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's my, my passion. Um, so what we do with, with Roundtable Legal is, is I represent, you know, creatives, artists, uh, creative entrepreneurs, you know, helping them protect their passions, build their brands, uh, build their businesses and, and everything in between. Um, because our conversation isn't directly kind of a one-on-one attorney client, uh, type of deal, I have to put a little disclaimer out there that whatever information I'm going to give out is, is just that it's just information. Um, if you have a specific question, a case specific type of deal, you should contact an attorney specifically on, on those kind of details. I'm just going to give general information of of kind of the questions that we're going to talk about. Um, I'd love to be able to kind of tailor my, my answers to all of the, the situations specifically, but, I've got to be very careful and give the typical lawyer response of it depends on some things and, and stuff like that. Um, I know we're going to talk a lot about contracts and intellectual property day. So I thought I'd give you a little overview of some IP uh, aspects. So IP is just another term for intellectual property. 
Um, there's trademarks and copyrights and patents. Uh, we weren't really talking about patents because they don't necessarily apply. Um, but trademarks and copyrights are really big um, in the artist field, especially in visual artists, which I assume that's, that's mostly uh, who your students are in the academy or visual yeah. artists. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so trademarks are very important. That's basically, you know, your brand, um, the source of how people know uh, where your art is coming from. You know, uh, you think of popular brands like Nike or Coca-Cola or uh, Tiffany's, Prada, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, they've all built up this, this reputation of how good their product is, the quality of it, the kind of customer service they provide. Um, that's the value that's built into this trademark. Um, so using artists, for example, so Banksy, uh, Banksy has a, a trademark on his name. Um, and so anything that's, you know, done with Banksy on it, um, you know, he gets credit for that. It also helps protect his, you know, identity, it protects that source of goods. So um, let's take, um, let's take Coca-Cola. You can protect your name. You can protect your logo. Uh, the visual representation of that. You can protect the slogan that goes with it. Uh, you can protect, um, so the shape of a Coca-Cola bottle, it's a very specific shape. That's trademarked. Mm. Um, you can protect uh, sounds. Have you ever heard the NBC chimes? Those, that ding, ding, ding that they do oh, yeah. uh, with the network. That's a copyright, or that's a trademarked um, sound. And so they're the only ones that can use that in relation to uh, TV and visual footage. Um, but so for artists and things like that, it's very important to protect your brand. Um, I, I'm trying to think of some, some options and things like that. So people can try to kind of steal your name and, and that source of goods. Um, Randy Bacon's a, a really well-known local photographer. Um, and so if somebody went on and, and they did photography and they said his name at last name is spelled with a C B A C O N. If they said Randy Bacon B A K O N photography, it would be confusing to uh, the consumers out there, the clientele, and there could be some mistakes made of where does this actual phot photograph come from? And he wants to be able to protect what what uh, what he's built up in his reputation, all of that time, that work, that sweat equity. Um, you know, you do so much social media and, and marketing stuff. And so if somebody came along and said, oh, hey, my, my name's Andrea Earhart, but it's spelled differently, or just call me Andrea E, and, and they do um, butterfly wings or, you know, whatever it is that they're going to do, they're, they're trying to piggyback off of that goodwill, and you want to be able to protect that as, as much as possible. Um, trademarks are difficult to protect if it's just a name of somebody, so a surname, um, so Randy Bacon or uh, Andrea Earhart. Um, but you've also got uh, the Paint It Red. You use that as well, and Paint It Red is is much easier to um, protect because it's more of a creative name than just a surname. There are certain guidelines about how you can protect a surname. It just kind of takes a little bit of time. You have to acquire that that distinctiveness in the market to where people really know who you are and, and everything like that. So it's a complicated process, but it's a very valuable form of intellectual property. Um, it's, it's a, a process I would suggest going through with an attorney if you're ever going to set it up. Um, it doesn't cost a ton of money, um, but it is something that you create a, a monopoly in your brand and you own that and you can license that out. And, and so there's, there's a lot of value in that. Um, copyrights are kind of a different dish of fish. Um, copyrights are automatic. I know we're going to talk a little bit about um, registration of copyrights. You know, I'm, I'm going to do this work. Well, do I have a copyright in this or not? Um, copyrights are automatic. So basically, any original work of authorship that's fixed on a tangible medium is copyrighted automatically. You don't have to do anything else. You could be in your bedroom doodling on some scratch paper and you put that pen to paper, it is copyrighted. It is yours, it belongs to you. Nobody else can copy that work. Um, it is that simple. Um, now, the, the trick comes in as to what kind of rights you have, because uh, you get kind of a bundle of rights along with the copyright. Um, and then you also have, um, if, if somebody infringes on your copyright, that means somebody steals it, does something, 
invades on those those rights that you have of your copyright, then you, you kind of have to you have to act and, and protect your work. Um, so before you can bring any kind of infringement suit or anything like that, they do have to be um, they do have to be registered. Um, there's different ways to do it. You can register an individual work. Um, there's new legislation that came down where uh, you can register groups of works, and it actually saves you a ton of money uh, doing that because typically it's about 55 bucks uh, to register a single work that you have. But let's say you do a group of paintings and uh, you can do up to 10 in a group um, registration and it's $85 instead of 55. So, I mean, it, it saves you quite a bit of, of money doing a group registration and everything like that. Okay. So um, like, do you have to have a copyright on, on something like say, say I make these wings back here and then somebody, duplicates them and does the exact same thing and I don't have a copyright on it, do I still have any rights? So um, you, you automatically have a copyright on that painting behind you because okay. you are the original author of that work. Um, you put uh, paint to, to canvas and that is all that need, that's needed to qualify as, as copyrightable. So you own a copyright in it. If you want to take someone to court to sue them about infringing on your work, then you have to have that registered through the copyright office before you can bring a suit. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't uh, have an attorney write some really awesome cease and desist letter or send them a licensing agreement, which is something I suggest to do, um, to, to use your copyrighted work. Um, so free legal tip, anytime you do any type of work, um, you can always use that little C with a circle around it that designates that as, as a copyrighted work. Um, you don't have to do that to show that it's copyrighted. Um, it's just kind of something that lets other people um, be aware that you're protecting your work. I got the you. same kind of thing goes with trademark, too. Um, I'm sure you've seen the little TM with the circle around it um, and the R with the circle around around it in things. Yeah. So the R means register. Um, that means that it's actually registered through the federal United States Patent and Trademark Office. And you can't use that unless you have an actual registered trademark. Um, but the TM, you can use any time. Um, so if you are using your brand, so let's say paint it red, you can put a little TM after it and with the circle. And that means that you're, you're enforcing and protecting your trademark that you're building in that brand, okay? And that's a common law trademark. You don't have to do anything to, to get it. It's just yours because you're using that brand in commerce and, and it's, it's representative of, of you and your, your product and your services and, and everything like that. Huh. Um, okay. Going back to copyright for a second. Now tell me, so I geek out about all of this stuff. So you're going to have to tell me if I need to slow down or, or anything. Oh, no. like that. You're good. This is something great. Important, something important to remember about copyright is that it covers the actual material expression of what you're doing. It doesn't cover like concepts or ideas or techniques. Um, so if you're doing butterflies, that's, that's an idea. It's not no other artist in the world can do butterflies right. because you've done butterflies. Uh, now they can't copy your work that you've done. They can't do anything that's a derivative work something that's a different work based upon that original. They can't. Uh, oh, they can't do that. So like what, what if they painted a yellow butterfly just like this, like exactly like this and they were copying it, but they changed it a little bit is what happens then. So you would have standing to say that they have produced a work that's substantially similar to yours okay. that some consumer would find confusing and they okay. would, possibly mistake it. And so you you could you could consider that a derivative work possibly. That actually happened in Bolivar and I, do, I went through this. So I'm just really making sure that I had ground to stand on. I was like, hey, you can't do that. So she just changed a little bit to make it different. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what happened. And I mean, I don't want to like go to court or anything, yeah. but. No, but it's, and you not everything has to be a, a lawsuit. I mean, yeah. there can be a lot of friendly conversations about artists uh, sharing creative stories and, and, you know, there's, there can be licensing that's given, uh, for somebody to be able to use something that's derivative. Um, you own the copyright. So you own all this bundle of, of, of rights that you have 
to be able to do what you want with it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about reference photos and how that works with yeah. things. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, like licenses or, or displaying works publicly and things like that. So if somebody buys, um, buys your, your work, even an original work, do you have any rights left in that? You know, and so we can talk about how all that stuff works. Okay, great. Um, so do you have any other general questions about copyright or, or trademark before we kind of get into some of the individual questions? So like on, on that topic, basically, so instead of asking her to change it a little bit, I could have, I should have gone to her and be like, okay, you can license this. That's a different way to do it. Yeah, so that's that's my first uh, my first option. That I if an artist comes to me and says, "Hey, somebody is infringing on my copyright. Um, I took this photograph and they put it on their website, or I painted this uh, this this picture and they've actually reproduced it just in different colors, just the same kind of thing that you're talking about." Um, then my first thing to to the artist is, let's look at this as a business opportunity. Okay, um, let's create a license. It's a really simple license that they can use your work in this specific instance for this specific purpose for a limited period of time. You've got to be really narrow and strict on how you, you word that language because you don't want to give them a, a, a large license to be able to do it over and over and over and over again. You want them just to be able to do it this one time and then they pay you a fee for being able to do that. Like and you that. can also put in there... Um, attribution rights. You can say, if you want to use this, we'll license this to you, you pay me this fee, and then you also have to give me attribution, saying this was inspired by, works created by, paint it red, Andrea Earhart. Yeah. yeah. So, like um, there's a lot of things that you can do with licenses and, and everything like that. So, believe in the power of your creativity and your work that you have, because you've got a lot of it. And businesses, people will try to take advantage of that. And that's one of the big things that I try to stand against is, you know, I, I try to, you know, give voice to the artists in the legal realm because there's a lot of complicated stuff out there and a lot of things that people just try to push uh, artists around because they're, they're an artist and they don't think that they know what the business side of it is, but you do and you have value in your work. And so you got to protect that. So true, so true. Yeah, I've had a magazine approach me saying that they wanted to use my wings for an, an advertisement for Geico. And they were like, oh, this is going to be amazing for you. I was like, no problem. My fee is this. And they're like, oh, no, no. And then they didn't do it. I was like, what? You're using this as an advertisement. So I just wanted to give that example, too, of like, people will take exactly what you said. People will take, take, take. And then and if you don't know, then you don't know. Right, right. And they, they will. And, and a lot of times if you're working with somebody and they won't do a contract with you, they won't do something written down or they don't want to do a license, then that's a big red flag to kind of avoid that situation um, because they will just harness whatever material they get from you and, and use it till it's, it's just burnt to the ground. I mean, I was working with an artist uh, from Kansas City um, who had a shop um, in a different state want to take their mural that they had done and use it um, in different products that they were selling in their shop on coffee mugs, on um, you know, cutting boards. And then they also wanted to uh, do little matte prints um, of the, the work itself and sell it to people in their, their little studio that they had. And they were offering a royalty on that, but it was a very small royalty. And the artist was super excited just to get their work out and, and do something. And I was very supportive of that. But you've also got to give the value to your work and know what a proper royalty would be. And, and that when you're doing a royalty of a work on an item, such as like a cutting board, a coffee cup, a mouse pad, you know, things like that, that's different than giving that same kind of royalty on an actual print that somebody could hang in their house or their business. You want to always uh, ask for a higher royalty on something like that. Okay. Awesome. So okay. let's, let's yeah. flip the script a little bit and say like, sure. like I, I want to use a reference photo that I found on Google, that kind of approach, like what's legal. Okay. Um, reference photos are really interesting. Um, the thing to know about them is you got to think about what the idea is behind what a reference photo is. So a reference photo isn't, something for you to look at and to copy, you know, you want to be able to use a reference photo and 
pull details from whatever that 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 image is um, to use in your work. Um, so let's say it's a bird. Okay, you want to be able to use that reference photo to look at the texture of the feathers, to look at the the length of the beak in comparison to the head of the bird. Um, look at how the angle of the head sits. You don't want to just recreate one photo onto a, a, a painting, you know, because that's a copy. That's a derivative work. Even though it's not a photo of a photo, it's a painting of a photo, but it's the same. And so you would, you'd be invading on their derivative work uh, copyright that they have in the photograph. Um, an option that I tell a lot of artists who have trouble finding uh, reference photos to use um, there are a lot of royalty-free Creative Commons license photos out there on the internet that you can use um, as reference photos, and you don't have to be as worried about copying something that it's too close. Um, I also recommend making your own uh, uh, reference photos if you can. I know you recently went on this awesome, spectacular honeymoon trip, um, and you took tons of photos of the, the wildlife and the penguins and things like that. And you, you own the copyright and all those photos. So you can use all those photos as your reference photos for anything you wish to paint. Um, you just got to be very careful because the person who took the photo owns that copyright. So you can, you can ask permission from them to use their photo in, in a painting if you want to. Um, but you've got to be careful because that also puts them on notice that you're going to be doing a painting somewhat based on their work. And they may not, they may say no. Okay. And then you're, you're kind of put setting yourself up for a possible, oh, hey, you can't use my photo. I told you you can't use my photo. You used it anyway. I know you tried to make it different, but it's not different enough. And then you get into this arguing match. Um, so try to use reference photos for what the purpose of a reference photo is, for taking those details from what they've done. There's a, there's a really famous case. Um, it's it's a, the Associated Press versus Ferry case. Um, you'll know it by, it's a, a photograph of Barack Obama that was made into kind of a political poster. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Of him, and it's got like these um, obscure colors on it. Um, and so the artist took artistic liberty and kind of took the photo, but made it different in their own spin on it. Um, but that was a, a big derivative case where it was settled out of court, um, basically a split of the profits on everything because they saw it to be a derivative where the person who did the actual photograph owned the rights and they didn't ask permission. They didn't do any attribution, nothing like that. So yeah, if I take a photo of an animal and I make it into rainbow, that's not enough to that's not enough of a difference if I use that exact like animal shape and everything to see the detail, but I change every color in it. It's still not different enough to be like completely careful. Right. Yeah. So I, it's, it's very much a case by case basis. I know you want an exact answer. <laughs> I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> um, um, but I can't. So that's, that's the power of, of being friends with an attorney or having an attorney that you can call and say, Hey Corey, I want to do this this painting based on this reference photo. Let's talk about how much stuff I I can change or need to change. Uh, what do you think? And you can get a real you know opinion on what your your legal ground is on whether you're invading somebody's rights or not. Um, but each specific uh, painting, photograph, mural, they're all different, and it all depends on the original photograph that's done what kind of rights they still have in that photograph. And so there's a lot of stuff that goes into being able to give an opinion like that. Okay, good, good. Awesome. Okay, so let's switch uh, switch it over just a little bit. I think we've got a really good uh, general and just and detailed idea of what a, a copyright is. I think you explained that perfectly. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> and so let's move on to, um, let's talk about an an LLC a little bit. So a lot of people have questions with what is an LLC? Why do I need that over a sole proprietorship? Can you just fill us in on everything with that, please? Uh, sure. So there are, there are different business structure models that you have throughout uh, your various states. I know that you have uh, students all across the nation. Um, each state is very specific on what their rules are, um, but we're talking generally sole proprietorship versus LLC. 
I love the LLC model. I'm a big proponent of that. I suggest that to a lot of my artist clients. Um, sole proprietorships, however, they're very easy to do. They're what most artists start out doing um, because there's not a lot of involved in just setting them up and running with it. But in that, there are not, uh, there aren't as many advantages and there are not the protections um, that are there for an LLC. So a sole proprietorship, the, the government doesn't look at it um, as a separation between you as an artist and a business. So it's all the same. An LLC is you as an artist and then you have your business and your business shields you. Okay. So the LLC can act as like an umbrella or a shield against any type of potential um, monetary or, or legal um, type of issues that come up. Um, they can, uh, that's, that's the biggest aspect is that it's, it's a shield against debts and, and legal issues. Um, another advantage um, is when you have an LLC, you can get something that's called a tax exempt letter uh, for buying um, some of your, your goods needed to uh, make your, your paintings, so your canvases, your brushes, your paints, that kind of stuff. How do you, you get, get a tax exempt that? letter? I need to do that. Oh. It's been on my okay. to-do list for a long time. <laughs> yeah. So each state is different. Um, again, I'm going to say that over and over and over again. Um, each state is different, um, but they, when you register as an LLC and you register your, your license and, and your sales tax, um, uh, you get a sales tax number from the state. At the same time, there's a form you can fill out um, that's basically a tax-exempt form. And you can take that to you know, uh, your, your wholesalers or your department stores, wherever you're buying your, your goods. Yeah. Um, and you present that to them and they don't charge you tax on it because you're using it to create a product. Hmm. Um, you, you can't do that as, as a sole proprietorship because there's no differentiation between you as an artist and the business An LLC, you can get a tax exempt letter. Um, so that's a major advantage, uh, that I see for a lot of artists who, who use a lot of material in their work and, and want that advantage of, of the sales exempt um, aspect. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Let's see. Um, let me see if there are any other LLCs questions on here. Um, um, oh, so, so someone had a question and I think I did the answer to this one, but, um, Ashley mentioned, what happens if you get hurt on the job? Who's responsible? Does an LLC cover insurance or is that separate business insurance? Um, yeah, what, what happens? So uh, that really kind of depends on what you're set up as. Um, and also, you know, most of the time that's all insurance based. Um, if you're an LLC, um, if you are a sole employee, you're not going to have something like workers' compensation. Uh, workers' compensation, at least in the state of Missouri, is required for businesses that have five or more employees. Um, and that is insurance that helps protect an on-the-job type of injury. Um, otherwise, you're looking at just general liability insurance, um, premises liability insurance, things like that. Uh, if you're a sole proprietor, you're probably looking at your own personal um, health insurance for, you know, if something happens while you're, you're on the job. Um, you can get um, general business insurance if you are a sole proprietor. I mean, it doesn't prohibit you from doing that. Um, it's just, it's, it's easier if there's a separation between you and, and, and the business itself. So, okay. Awesome. Perfect. Um, insurance so is very important. Um, I'm just going to throw that out there. Insurance is important. If you, you have a business, um, LLCs also can have employees. Um, sole proprietorships cannot. Um, and so I know that there are a lot of artists that I worked with that had, um, you know, festivals that they were going to. Um, art fairs, shows, things like that that got canceled because of all of the COVID uh, issues happening. Um, insurance can help protect you with things like that. Um, it can, you know, cover things like business interruption and event interruption. So if you're speaking at an event or you're um, having a, an art show that you're going to, it can cover the cost of what you've lost and things like that. So insurance is, is good to look into. Yes, for sure. Insur insurance is very important. My, my husband is a an insurance agent. So oh. he, he's always like, Hey, have them sign this. They, if they're going to work for you, they need to sign this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> All the things. Yeah. Okay. So let's again, let's the script a little bit. I think we've covered an LLC. Like everybody. There's a lot of scripts. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> everybody get an LLC is basically what we're, what we're saying. Get an LLC. It protects you. <laughs> 
Um, yes. Contracts. So can we make our own contracts? And then also in the questions I mentioned to you, I know that every state is different and that's probably what you're going to say, but I, ha I have a contract that a, an attorney <laughs> uh, made for me. And so I kind of gave it to everybody in the group. I'm like, feel free to use this. I think it'll work. Um, what's the thing with that? Sure. Um, so contracts, like you said, vary state by state. Um, it's, it's just, it, different terms can mean different things in different states. And some states allow you to use terms in a contract that other states don't. So you could give somebody uh, a contract that's made specifically for a situation in Missouri that doesn't apply in Texas for some reason. Um, and it, it may apply. It just may not cover them and protect them as best as it can. My rule of thumb is something is better than nothing. So always have some sort of contract. Always make sure that it is a written contract. Uh, verbal contracts, handshake deals, those are all really nice. Um, but it's really important to have something that is written down. It doesn't have to be um, beautiful and frame worthy. You don't have to be able to put it on your wall. You can write it on a napkin at a diner while you're talking to a client and say, I agree to do this, you agree to pay me this, we're both gonna sign this, and this is a contract that we have between ourselves. Okay. Uh, a contract only has, it, it, it's in its base entity, it, it has three parts. There's an offer, acceptance of that offer, and some consideration, which is mean value, um, in that contract, okay? That there's somebody giving something for something, something else. And so that's, that's all you need to have a contract. Um, but it's very important to have it written down um, because there's a ton of he said, she said, well, I agreed to make this and they said they would pay me this amount, but there's nothing written down about how much they were going to pay me. So how do you prove that? The whole thing is about proof. So um, as with your contract with that was drawn up by an attorney in Missouri, I don't know what the, the subject matter of the contract is, but there's a ton of different kinds of contracts. Um, and they all apply differently to different situations. So just be aware um, that Google is not always your friend. Um, if you're gonna look on the internet to find something, um, don't just try to pull piecemeal little terms from this contract you find on an internet or this contract you find on the internet and, and Frankenstein together a contract. I would not recommend that because they may not go together. <laughs> um, and sometimes there are really important terms that you wanna have in there. Uh, so for example, like with events and things like that, um, you want to have something that's called a force majeure clause. It's this really fancy French term that just means, uh, out of your control. So if you're signed up for, uh, to appear in an arts festival and you've paid X amount of money and to be there, but something happens, uh, an act of God or COVID, um, is a possibility in that type of thing. Um, then that just means that something happened out of your control and both parties kind of go back to where they started from. Um, and so it's, it's very helpful to have uh, important terms in there and to at least have an attorney uh, work with you on an initial contract to set it up the right way. And they can also work with you on, on how to make that uh, more liquid like water with other, other types of contracts that you're going to work with and stuff. Okay, perfect. We have a question in here. Actually, I, didn't, uh -oh. I didn't know that you could chat in here. So if anybody has questions, you can do use the chat and let and ask Corey. Uh, Christine says, when I have a client give me a deposit to create a design, there's a chance that the project might not go through. Do I need them to sign something in case they try to get their deposit back? Sure. Um, so again, very specific question and state-based, you know, yeah. so you got to look at where you're at and things like that. Um, when you are doing some sort of deposit, I would make sure to put that in a contract, whether it's refundable, not refundable, um, what constitutes the fact that you're earning this um, deposit. So let's say you've got a, a ton of people who want to have a piece of your work. There, there are commissions just lining up out the door. And this deposit that they pay you basically saves their spot in line. You want to put that in the contract. This is why you're paying me $500 is to save your spot in line. And if you decide you don't want this any longer, I'm sorry that that's, that's hard, but I still get that money because I have saved your spot in this, this order here to do your work. And so you've got to make sure and just line item and, and list everything out there. Um, don't, 
you don't have to be cute about it. You can just be very frank and, and, and hey, this is what's going on between us. And this is what we agreed to. And this is how we're, we're, we're gonna, gonna put it in writing. So yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And just getting everything just out front and like bold, like this is what we expect. Cause for some, some people, they think like you, you might get your deposit back after you, you know, leave the hotel room in a, in a better way that you like, there's just different things that people interpret. Right. Right. And that's very important. Like I said, in the contract to put, whether it's refundable or not refundable, um, you know, it, it's, it's called earnest money. Uh, when you're putting money forward, um, it's money that you're earning uh, before any actual services are being done, but you're still earning it in a way. Uh, you're doing something to earn that money. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, she had a follow-up question, I think. Yeah. Um, she says, do I need to actually have them sign it? Or can I just stay what the terms are in the email? Okay. So that's a really important question. Um, signatures are important. It doesn't matter if you sign it, if you're wanting to enforce it against the other person. So that's how enforcement works. It's best to have all parties sign it. Let me put that out there. If everybody can sign it, that's awesome. But you have to have a signature of the person that you're wanting to enforce the contract against. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> how do you know they agreed to it? You know, unless they signed off on it. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, also, like, what if I forget to have someone sign a contract and we have emails stating, stating what's, what's happening and what the pay is and what's expected. Um, and then they don't pay. And it was like $2,000 or something. Can I take them to small claims court without a contract and it still hold up? Okay. Um, so complex situation yeah. again, <laughs> case by case type of deal. Um, generally you'd have to look and see what is contained in those emails. If there are terms from your side as an, as an artist that you're making an offer to do X, Y, or Z, and in another email exchange, that's like a reply to that, they're going to say, okay, well, I'll pay you A, B, and C for that. And then it's coming both from your email accounts. They put their electronic signature on there. You know, that could be considered a contract. You can piecemeal things together like that. So it could, it could be evidence for an actual valid contract. Okay, awesome. Uh, Denise has a question. LLCs, when making taxes and purchases, do you have to pay those taxes back when you file your taxes? Different state by state because you're getting your tax exempt letter from the state. Um, I am not an accountant, so I'm going to put that out there. Um, I don't file taxes for people. It's best to talk to your accountant about what your particular state does and how you need to set up your sales taxes on any type of, of artwork that you're sending out and producing and things like that. So I'm going to leave that to the accountants. Okay. It's, it's probably actually back on the whole copyright thing. So I actually had talked with an artist about a year ago and I actually think she's on this call right now, but I, like, I, I mentioned this, this is the very last paragraph in the thing and it's, it's kind of broad, but like I, it, it's all been resolved, but like basically it was, she was contracted to paint a restaurant for a restaurant owner. And there, there was an artist who had previously like kind of designed the whole theme of their restaurant and stuff. And now the owner did not want to work with that artist for whatever reason. And they wanted a new artist to expand their second location. Um, and then okay. she painted it, and then there was a little bit of like a tough. Um, what I know, it's, what, what, what's your opinion on something like this? So, so a, a, there was a little bit of a tough between the artists and and the business owner. Yeah. So, well, what happened actually? Basically, the the previous artist, the first artist, saw that they, he was expanding, and they were painting something very similar to what he had already done because it was part of his brand, but it was very different. Like the people were different, the scenes were different, but it was similar. And okay. he saw that and was like, what the heck? Yeah, so what you're looking at is, is this a derivative work okay. where the original artist owns the, the copyright in that derivative work? Or is this something that is just an idea, um, that they're taking the generalized idea from it, um, that this is a, a scene, you know, with, with family sitting at a diner or whatever the, the scene was. I don't know what the picture was. Maybe it was uh, a zoo. 
Um, and, and so they're, they're taking a general abstract kind of idea, characteristics, things like that. And so that's your, your balancing scale of, of how close to the original work it is, whether you're just kind of taking a, taking a general idea of it or you're actually copying it, just changing a little thing here and there, um, taking people that were in a park and putting them in space suits in outer space, you know, uh, it, it's, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of wiggle room on, on that kind of thing. Um, something important, you're talking about a business owner who uh, commissioned an artist to do their restaurant. You've got to also think about what's in the contract between the business owner and the artist. Um, if they are an independent contractor, which most artists are, they're doing freelance work, doing commission work like that, um, then you have to be careful because there could be a work for hire uh, provision or term in that contract. And if it's a work for hire, then the artist doesn't own the copyright in it. The business owner would own the copyright in it and all of the bundle of rights that go with that. Um, if you are an employee for something and you're doing graphic designs for a company and you're employed by them, then you're doing all work for hire and anything that you're creating is owned by that business or company. Um, so it's just very important to be aware of any type of work for hire um, type of provision in a, in a contract that you're doing, if you're doing commission work. Um, and if there's something like that, you want to specifically state that you are not giving up any of your copyrights um, that you have in that work um, because you want to protect those because those are very, very, very valuable. Um, I know one of your, your listeners had a question about, you know, if they do a commission work, um, and they sell that original piece to somebody, do they lose all of their, their rights? Well, it depends on the contract. If there's a work for hire provision in there, they could. Otherwise, they're just selling the product. They're selling a painting, you know, and that person that buys it has the right to put that in their home and, you know, show it to their friends and family there and, and everything like that. But they don't have the right to, say, put it in, a, in an art show for public viewing or because that's a, a public performance right the artist retains. Um, they don't have the right to um, you know, put it out there for other people to do derivative works. If they want to you know, do something that's similar to it on their own, they can't say, well, I own this painting, and I'm going to do something similar because I own this painting. They don't own the rights to do that. So. Okay. And so say... Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah, so like I say, if the artist wants to make yeah. prints of that one and sell them, like, and sell like um, 100 prints, they can do that without the original one who bought it. So they can't say anything. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there you may have a buyer who wants to have the only work. They want to have, this is the original work, and I want this to be a one-of-one, -one, only, only piece like this. You got to make them pay for it. You know, they want to own the rights to keep that exclusive, put that in a contract, give them the, the rights to it. And you can limit those rights to where they can't even do any derivative works to it. But you also agree that you're not going to do any additional paintings as well. So then it creates an, an absolute true original. Yeah. But, but you've, got, you've got to charge a premium for something like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I always encourage my students too to like like put yourself in the business owner's perspective as well because like I, I get hired for for well, work for hire all the time that I have no rights for like Bass Pro I don't have any rights to that I can they don't even like if I show it on social media and that's okay like that's their that's their brand that's their like I'm painting it for them and like that's okay you guys don't have to own everything that you do but if you can then do it right right. Absolutely. I think we basically got through everything. If there's anything anybody wants to add last minute or Corey, if there's anything else, uh, but somebody did mention uh, like what are like the most common things that artists should watch out for? Did we cover most of those or have you seen anything else that's pretty common? Oh my gosh. Um, so most of the, I cover a huge gambit of different uh, issues for artists, everything from publicity rights to copyrights, to trademarks, to um, royalties, licenses. Um, people have questions about, you know, a lot of things on the internet. Um, when they put something on the internet and somebody takes a photo of that and puts it on a website, um, it's still part of copyright. There's a different aspect that's 
that helps um, artists with that. Um, it's called the, the DMCA or the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, it's a way for artists to help protect their work online. Um, there is the Visual Artists Rights Act, which helps people who do murals and things like that from having their murals uh, destroyed or manipulated or anything like that. Um, mostly uh, the problems that, that come up involve copyrights and contracts. Those are the, the two biggest things. Um, sometimes artists lease spaces for studios and stuff like that, and you've got to be very conscientious of what the terms are in those leases. Um, be aware of anything that's called a personal guarantee um, because that will supersede your LLC umbrella or shield um, if you have that because it puts you personally on the hook for any kind of indebtedness that you have for a lease. Um, so lots, lots of different things. Um, I, I help artists with, with everything um, and I'm, I happily do so. I, I like, you, like you can see, I geek out about it. Um, I'm here locally in Springfield, but I, I have clients that are regionally, nationally, internationally. Um, copyrights and trademarks are a, a national type of thing. Um, so there's some state specific stuff, but mostly they're done federally. Um, and so I work with a lot of people uh, in all states. Um, awesome. Do you have my contact information if anybody has any other questions or things like that? So my website is roundtablelegal.com, um, like King Arthur and the Round Table. Um, and you can contact me via email at connect at roundtablelegal.com. Okay. Uh, I'm on social media, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, like my Facebook page. That'd be really awesome. Yeah. Um, I do um, very uh, inexpensive consults with artists on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I call them legal strategy sessions. Uh, I do them for 100 bucks. They're supposed to last an hour-ish. Sometimes an hour ends up being three, you know, yeah. just depending on what's going on. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm here to help. That's the biggest thing. And so um, I find that, you know, sometimes artists don't have a lot of money to, to spend on expensive contracts and, and things like that. Um, I do everything on a transparent flat fee basis. I don't charge an hourly fee. Uh, so if you want a contract done or want me to review a license or, you know, things like that, uh, I'll let you know up front what it's going to cost. Um, and so you can prepare and budget for that and that kind of stuff. But if you just want to talk about general issues or what you might need or what you might need or not need a lawyer for, or what's something you could do on your own, um, you can always contact me and we can set up a legal strategy session and discuss all your specific issues. Perfect. This is awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with us. I so appreciate this. I feel like we just got a complimentary legal session <laughs> right here for everybody in the Artist Academy. <laughs> I feel it was a lot of information. So if you uh, if if you need to have me on again, and we can go slower on a on a topic by topic basis, I'm happy to do that. So I really appreciate the opportunity to to speak to your students and and be a part of this. Awesome. Yeah, we we so appreciate it. So I get this question quite a bit. So um, Sarah mentioned, is there any legal aspect of painting copyright images in someone's home if if it's for hire or for not? So say I wanted to paint a Disney scene in my bathroom or in my friend's bathroom, what's the what's the legal thing on Disney? So um, anytime you are taking someone else's copyrighted work and you are painting it yourself, doing it especially in a commercial type of nature, mm -hmm. um, then you're putting yourself at risk a little bit. Um, the, the less people could promote that on online or, you know, keep it just purely, hey, this is in my home. It's not, you know, anything like that. But you, you just got to be careful because technically you're still violating somebody's copyright that they have um, by recreating uh, that image. So you just have to be, be careful about it. Okay. Sounds good. All right. That's it. So thank you again so much. Um, I'm going to actually put this into a podcast episode and it will come out um, about a week from now. And I'll send you an email with everything. And I'll also include all of your links, your, your website and everything in the podcast notes as well so that anybody can contact you, which I highly, highly encourage. If you guys have any questions, please reach out to him. This has been awesome. You're very well spoken and so informative. So this is, this is amazing. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm happy to be on and I'm happy to, to give any help I can. And so you just let me know what I can do to be a further assistance. Will do. All right. I'll, I will talk to you later. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. This episode is sponsored by the Artist Academy Advanced Membership. 
a program for artists who want to up-level their art game by taking it from a hobby or a side hustle to a full-time six-figure art business. With weekly trainings that include step-by-step -step proven art business techniques, plus painting tutorials from yours truly, <laughs> and other guest artists who are masters in their field, you will be well-equipped to learn and grow into the highly skilled and highly profitable artist you know you're meant to be. I've figured out what it takes to build my own six-figure art business, and now my heart is set on teaching aspiring artists like you to do the same. It's not hard, but it does require your time and dedication. So if you're up for the challenge, go to advancedmember.com. That's advancedmember.com to learn more. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. If you review our podcast and send a screenshot of that review to me on Instagram, I am at art by Andrea Earhart. I will then promote your art on my story and tag you as a little thank you for helping me grow this podcast and our Artist Academy community. I have a reach of over 50,000 on Instagram. So this is a little help me to help you incentive. Also, if you ever want your questions answered in real time by myself or featured guests, then just hop on over to facebook.com slash groups slash Artist Academy to check out the schedule every Tuesday to catch us on live. I'll see you next week.